In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Uh, amen. So today we have this uh, third oration for the propagation of the faith. So we pray for more priests, for more vocations, and for the faith to be propagated all over the whole world. Before Bergoglio was elected, Jorge Bergoglio, before the, this very scandalous so-called papacy, it was a taboo inside conservative Novus Ordo circles to even mention the word sede vacante or sede vacantism. But today things have changed. That word is, is uh, quite often uh, used even in Novus Ordo circles, conservative, traditional Novus Ordo circles. Many are calling into question the legitimacy of Bergoglio. And many people uh, came up with ideas, uh, to, uh, like solutions to explain what is going on. Some of them have said that uh, Ratzinger never actually resigned from the papacy, he just retired uh, into the passive ministry, but he only retired from the active Petrine ministry, as they call it. So again, inside the Novus Ordo circles, people are saying that Ratzinger still is a pope, Bergoglio is not legitimate. Obviously, that's absolutely um, crazy and makes no sense. The only difference between Bergoglio and Ratzinger is the manner, the way in which they want to impose Vatican II. But substantially, the, uh, the ideas of both Ratzinger and Bergoglio are the same. That is Vatican II and uh, the new religion, the new gospel, the new doctrines that uh, were promulgated in that uh, so-called council. So, but since Bergoglio is more radical and more open in the way in which he does apply Vatican II, people uh, try to uh, go back to Ratzinger, which had a little more of a conservative taste, and therefore it's, very, it's confusing for them, uh, for Novus Ordo conservatives, um, to see what the problem really is. That is Vatican II, it's not a question of um, uh, a defect of resignation in the, on the part of Ratzinger, uh, it's a question of, of doctrine. Whether the doctrines that have been taught since the Second Vatican Council uh, are the same doctrines that were always taught by the Catholic Church or not. And that's the big, big question. So our position uh, is called sede vacantism because we do not recognize authority in, in Vatican II so-called popes. And uh, it, it, it has nothing to do with schism. Uh, in the Novus Ordo now they are talking about schism as something good. That is a cybergoglio in this apostasy and uh, what is going on in the, currently in the Amazon Synod and they see pagan worship in the Vatican Gardens and things like that, which is so obviously uh, of an apostasy. And they say, oh, probably it's good to go into schism. But schism is a sin. It's a sin that separates you from the church. Schism is lack of submission to legitimate authority. That is, you recognize in this case Bergoglio, as a pope, as a true, real pope, but you refuse to submit to his doctrine and to his authority, and, um, and you resist his so-called authority. But again, you are recognizing something in Bergoglio, that you are recognizing that he is actually the vicar of Christ on earth, and you are refusing submission to the person you think is the vicar of Christ on earth. And that's a sin. That is, if you do recognize Bergoglio as a true pope, you have to submit to him. And that's a condition for salvation. That is, submission to the pope is a condition for eternal salvation. 
So you cannot be in a situation in which you either, um, or in order to preserve the Catholic faith, you have to go into schism, which is a sin against charity, ultimately, and it's a mortal sin. You cannot be in that situation that you have a sin, whether you stay with Bergoglio, and you have a sin if you go into schism or if you uh, refuse uh, submission. So the only solution or the only possibility here is that somehow Bergoglio does not possess real authority, what is called jurisdiction or ecclesiastical authority. And therefore, when you uh, do not submit to him, you're actually not going into any sin of um, disobedience or season, but actually you are just recognizing the fact that he lacks authority. And therefore, uh, this uh, uh, is just a, a question of establishing a fact and seeing and acting according to a fact. That is, in this case, that he doesn't have authority. But it's very difficult for people to see that right now inside the Novo Sordo hierarchy and the Novo Sordo circles. Why? Because for many, many years, they tried to excuse uh, the so-called Vatican II popes from heresy and from error and say, no, it's, it's not, it's actually, Vatican II was a problem, but you can uh, have an interpretation of it in the light of tradition and so on and so forth. And that's the beginning of the problem. That is, when you do not see the big, the huge, uh, problem of Vatican II, the substantial change of doctrine, you are, by the very, very fact, bound to recognize authority where actually there is no authority to recognize. The first time I heard about the traditional faith and the traditional mass was when I was 16 years old, a long time ago. Uh, I was in high school and I grew up in the Novo Sordo, going to the Novo Sordo Mass. Etc. and receiving the you know, sort of sacraments. I had no idea that there, there was such a thing as a traditional mass. And uh, this uh, is probably um, something that happened to you too. If you grew up in the Novo Sordo, you came, somehow you came to the knowledge of a traditional mass and a traditional faith, and you decided to follow uh, that instead of continuing in the Novo Sordo. So I did that, but what was the, the thing that made me change or made me abandon the no sort of structures, it was the, the Second Vatican Council. When I was exposed to, uh, let's say, the documents, I, I read the documents, studied the documents, and compared them to previous teaching. And it's obviously, when you do that with uh, objectivity, without any preconceived ideas, like the SSPX has a preconceived idea that uh, Vatican II popes have to be popes, necessarily so. Uh, and therefore, obviously, if your premise is that no matter what, those people are true, real popes, when you go to the, the documents of Vatican II, you're going to try to make an interpretation or a spin of the, the, what the actual documents are saying. And you're going to try to just justify things or say, oh, this is not infallible. It was, this was pastoral. Uh, we are not bound for to this, etc." And many other, uh, basically, uh, ways to justify the position. Because again, their major premise is Vatican II popes are real popes. They have authority. But if you begin with the documents themselves, if you go and read the documents uh, that uh, promulgates religious liberty, for example, or ecumenism, and you compare with past teaching, like the syllabus of errors, in which Pope Pius IX condemned the religious freedom as a heresy, uh, obviously you, you cannot say these two doctrines come from the same authority. Somehow the second document, that is Vatican II, uh, does not proceed from the authority of God. Remember that all, all authority comes from God, the civil authority and the ecclesiastical authority. In the case of the Pope, when he's elected and he properly accepts his election, uh, he enjoys the power of Christ to rule the church. So if you say that the condemnation of religious liberty and the promulgation of religious liberty as a right proceed from the same authority, you have to affirm that Christ is contradicting himself because Christ is the one who gives 
authority to the Pope. That's why the Pope is called the Vicar of Christ on Earth. But the authority is the same. There's not two authorities, the Pope and the Christ. No, it's one authority. So when you compare the documents, one or the other have to be false. Um, and obviously the one that uh, came after has to be false because if not, you we have to say that the church was deceived for thousands of years in believing that the Roman Catholic Church is the only means of salvation and that we are all obliged to belong to this church and uh, in order to be saved. That's what the church always taught. But if you accept the Vatican II, you are bound to say that, no, there is more ways to be saved and also I have a right to choose whatever religion I see as the true one, independently of the objective reality. That is, independently of, uh, the, um, of the fact that the, only the Catholic Church is the only means of salvation. So now, always remember, when you have a discussion or when you're try to, trying to explain uh, what is going on today to someone that never heard of traditional Catholicism or sede vacantism, um, you have to always point out to Vatican II. But the next question is, how do you explain uh, what happened at Vatican II? How do you explain that someone who was elected to the papacy does not possess authority? Again, we know that Paul VI, when he signed those documents that contained error and heresy, he didn't possess papal authority at that very moment. What happened before? Was he elected properly? Uh, was he a pope before that? Did he fall from the office? or never had authority at all? So those are the questions that come afterwards. Once you realize that these people are not popes, you have to explain what happened because, again, the church is very uh, meticulous and very disciplined and very strict with regard to doctrinal things uh, and theological questions like that. So many times, even as a layperson, you have to do a little research to explain those things. Before Vatican II, lay, pe lay people were not obviously obliged to know more than the catechism, but today we have all of us, we have this special obligation to know a little more because uh, the faith uh, demands that we know what is going on in the church. Again, you are not all of you obliged to know theology uh, and to be experts, but at least you have to have a little explanation of what is going on. So, as I remember, always the, the first thing that comes to mind is oh, the, the reason why this happened, or the, re the reason why Paul VI and his successors um, did not, do not have authority, and even you can count John XXIII because he began the council, uh, is because they are heretics. That's the first thing that comes to mind. They are heretics, and therefore a heretic, we know that is not a member of the church, and uh, if you're not a member, you cannot be the head. So that's the, the very easy to argument to, to say and to explain uh, and, and easy to understand. But that argument is not perfect. There are many things that come into play when you bring up the argument of personal heresy. Many, many things. For example, when you say the word heresy, you can mean many things. You can mean material heresy, formal heresy. Material heresy is when someone says a heresy without realizing it, uh, without knowing it, uh, without culpability. And you can say, oh, in the case of a priest or a bishop, how you can have a material heresy. It can happen in the same way that it can happen that a doctor that you think that he knows his medicine and he knows very well what he's doing, when he has to cut the leg of someone to save the leg and uh, to save the, the person, he cuts the wrong leg. <laughs> And you, you, have, you say, what happened here? He was ignorant? How, how did he not know? Obviously, he's guilty, no, no doubt about that, of his error. But one thing is to be guilty of the ignorance, when the ignorance is voluntary. Another thing is to say that the doctor knew that what he was doing was wrong. That's two different things. So you may have a material heretic who does is obliged to know the faith, especially a priest of a bishop, a cardinal, a pope, 
Uh, but he may have been ignorant during his seminary or his training or whatever, and he is only a material heretic. You may say, oh, that's impossible with Bergoglio. Yes, I will, say, I will agree, uh, because he, many times he even said, or he realized, and he said, oh, what I am saying now may be a heresy, he said a couple of times at least. So he realizes that what he's saying is a heresy. So material heresy and Bergoglio, I don't think so. Uh, the same thing with Ratzinger, etc. But what happens with Cardinal Bork or Bishop Schneider? Those two are very conservative inside the nose order. Can you say for sure, can you judge them and say those people are former heretics because they adhere to Vatican II? I personally will say I, I cannot affirm that. I, you listen to what they are saying. They opposed, um, in this case, Bergoglio. They, in many ways, oppose Vatican II, even they understand that Vatican II is the problem, uh, but they seem not to really grasp the whole problem. And it seems, again, I can, nobody can judge the internal disposition of people that they are in good faith. That is, that they are uh, mistaken in being inside and also the structures and in justifying Vatican II somehow. But to say that they are formal heretics, I, I w you cannot affirm that. I, at least I cannot say that for sure. There is no evidence for that. I will give you another example of uh, somebody who definitely was a material heretic. Uh, Father Roger Marin, he was a Dominican theologian and priest, very prominent before Vatican II. He died in the year 2005, I believe, um, so long after Vatican II. You can go to YouTube, you understand Spanish, and there are conferences of Father Roger Marin uh, given in the year 2000s, and uh, you can tell that he preserved the faith, that he's not a heretic, he's not like Hans Kuhn, or Ratzinger, or Bergoglio, or Karl Runner. no, he's Catholic. Somehow he didn't see the problem, somehow he stayed inside the Novo Sordo structures, but to accuse him of formal heresy, who will do that? When he himself, when, when you listen to what he's saying, he's very, very Catholic. He, he repeats all of the tr traditional Catholic doctrine. And when Vatican II comes into play, he just tries to justify it or just to ignore it. Again, maybe he was culpable in that, in doing that. But again, it's not the same as formal heresy. So when you accuse someone of heresy, you have to be very, very careful. Once you establish, OK, there is material and formal. Material is not culpable. Formal is culpable. Uh, is that all? OK, no, this is not all. You have a formal heretic can be occult. That is that nobody knows. Nobody knows that he's a heretic. And uh, he incurs in the canonical effects of heresy, but not all of them. Uh, that is, he commits the sin of heresy, occultly, uh, but still, because he's occult, many of the effects, canonical effects of heresy do not come into play. So he will be ex excommunicated from the church and severed from the church. Yes, he will cease to be a member of the church just by occult heresy. But since the church is a public institution and as a visible society, nobody will ever know that. So there is a distinction there between what is Coram Deo on the presence of God and before God and Coram Ecclesia in the presence of the church. So you don't think about those distinctions. We just, we just say, oh, heresy, you are not a member, you cannot be the pope. You can have a occult heretic that becomes the pope. Theologians have spoken about that. And they say that even though that because of his heresy, he's not a member, and therefore in principle he cannot be its head, because he's so called, the church um, provides with the means for him to retain authority, or Christ supplies authority in the occult heretic. So again, you see, it's not that easy. You say it's heresy, heresy always detaches you from the church. Yes, but it can be occult. So, but here we are not talking about occult. Obviously, we are. Uh, talking about something which is manifest. The opposite of occult is manifest. Um, and as the word says, is when you manifest that her uh, heresy in, pre in the presence of people. If, if, that, if you manifest that heresy in the presence of a few people, 
is called that is called heresy um, um, private. So it will be uh, pu uh, private manifest heresy. Again, it's not the same as public heresy. You see, you can have occult and manifest, and you can have uh, private and public. So when you see uh, or you read theologians speaking about uh, the, the Pope, ipso facto, and all of the, by the very fact of his heresy, uh, he loses authority, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they are talking obviously about manifest public heresy. And you say, okay, it's easy. Bergoglio is a manifest public heretic, so what is the problem? The problem is that uh, then you have something called pertinacity. So you have heard this word probably, pertinacity. What is pertinacity? It's when the person knows uh, the, that something is heretical and he does it anyways. Pertinacity will make that heresy formal, but also will make it uh, a crime. And, and you might say, okay, it's easy, Bergoglio is, uh, is pertinacious. Obviously he knows he cannot claim ignorance. I would say yes, but the pertinacity can be both pertinacity of fact and pertinacity of law. So everything is not reduced to that, to just somebody is a public heretic. The pertinacity of fact means that, yes, I know, for example, if I, I were to say now uh, in, the, in the Holy Eucharist, Christ is not really present. That will be a heresy and that will be pertinacious because I know that Christ is, in the, is, is really present in the Holy Eucharist. At least I have studied that and I know by faith as the faith. But if I choose to deny that, I choose to deny my faith, and I say, no, Christ is not really present, that will be pertinacious with regard to the sin. But still, since there is no, nobody um, giving me a canonical admonition, still there is no pertinacity of law. And, uh, and therefore, again, public heresy and pertinacity itself is not just that simple. For pertinacity of law, you need, for example, a bishop, or somebody will denounce me, or Father Desposito is in a heresy, go to the bishop of the diocese. The bishop of the diocese call me to his office, <laughs> to his rectory, and he gives me the canonical admonition. I, we have evidence that you said from the pulpit that you do not believe in the real presence. There I have two options. I can say whatever it is inside of me, they can, nobody can say, can, can see, but I can, I can tell the bishop, I agree with you and I agree with the church. I'm sorry, I, that was my bad. I, I just uh, was mistaken or the way I spoke. I do believe in the real praises. And that's it, the canonical process ends there. And there is no legal pertinacity. Still, I can be pertinacious uh, with regard to the fact. I may be lying to my bishop. I may be just uh, trying to deceive him in order not to get punished or, or defraud. And, uh, but that's possible. So what happened there? You have somebody who is a public heretic, is pertinacious with regard to the fact, is not pertinacious with regard to the law. Uh, so that actually is what is going on today. You have many heretics, most of them in the Novus Ordo hierarchy, but there is, since all of them are in the same boat with regard to Vatican II, there is no one to point to the heresy legally, canonically, and to tell them, oh, this is a heresy, you have to do, you have to either recant it or we're going to uh, declare uh, the, the heresy and you will be sentenced. When you say the word sentence heres heresy and, and when you become a sentence heretic is when you lose all right in the church to jurisdiction and to exercise your apostolate. Before that, you can exercise your apostolate validly and sometimes even licitly. So you see how complicated it is. You can be a heretic, you can not believe in the Holy Eucharist, but if you go and, and convince your bishop that, that you actually do believe, uh, you can remain in your office, in your, in your, uh, uh, in your church, in your, ch in your parish, without any consequences with regard to the law. So what's actually what happened before Vatican II with many of the heretics that, that, that after, afterwards um, participated in Vatican II. Even Roncalli, who later on became John the Twenty-Third, he was summoned to the Pope because he was suspected of heresy. But he said, actually, it was a book that he was using a book that was in the index. You know, there is an index of forbidden books, a book that you cannot read, that you cannot study. 
and, um, and you cannot obviously propagate. And Ron Kelly, who was a, a professor of history, was using this condemned book to teach history. He was summoned to Rome uh, and uh, he lied. He said, no, I never ever used that book. He was lying. Now, now it's a fact that we know he was actually lying, but the, the authorities couldn't do anything. Okay, he's denying it. And he actually was on his knees crying and saying, no, I never used that. And so you, what do you do in that case? So he just survived and he was never sentenced. And he became a pope uh, later on, or at least apparently. So you see, it's not that easy. When you say, oh, somebody's a heretic, therefore, ipso facto, and all of these things. Uh, there is many positions with, even with regard to that. St. Saint, Saint Robert Bellarmine says, if a pope becomes a heretic, a public heretic, uh, he, um, by that very fact, without any declaration, he loses authority. Obviously, we ag agree with St. Robert Bell Bellarmine on that. The problem is there are other opinions on the matter. And even when you agree with that uh, theological position of the, of the heretical pope, you have very good authority saying doesn't end there, uh, the, the question. Even if someone is elected to the papacy, and as a pope, he's a public manifest heretic, Christ is able still to supply jurisdiction. Now, why am I am saying all of this? Because some say the vacantes will reduce the whole crisis of the Catholic Church today to the question of personal heresy. So now, if, if that's a problem, what, how do we show people that uh, this, the Vatican II so-called popes uh, have no authority? How do you prove that? The, I mentioned before that um, the reason why theologians even said that even a heretic, a public heretic, can still receive this supply power, the key is because they were talking about someone that didn't have the intention of teaching the heresy. That's not the case with the Vatican II so-called popes. From the beginning, they have the intention of imposing all of those doctrines, religious liberty, ecumenism, collegiality, and they subsisted in heresy, which I will explain uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, the, all of those things, they, not only they are Mm, uh, believe in those things themselves in publicly, but they want to pass that as author authoritative teaching, as the magisterium of the church. And that's the problem. And that's how we know that they do not enjoy authority. Again, uh, jurisdiction or ecclesiastical uh, authority is defined as the public power of governing and leading the faithful towards the goal of eternal life. That is, the Pope receives authority in order to lead the faithful to heaven. That's it. It's that simple. So the reason why Peter received the keys from Christ was in order to lead people to heaven, to show the way. This is the way in which you save your soul. That's it. That's the whole purpose and reason why the Pope exists, why the Pope has power. Now, if you see someone in a white castle in the Vatican, teaching something universally to everyone that harms or uh, souls and that prevents people from going to heaven. Again, remember, the authority of the Pope is given to, in order to lead them to heaven. If he's say, uh, teaching something that prevents people from going to heaven, obviously he cannot enjoy authority because authority was given to him for the opposite, for leading people to heaven. So that's the, the argument. That's how we show, how the, we demonstrate that these people do not possess papal power, nor supply power. Because again, Christ will never supply the power to lead people to hell. Uh, it does not, that doesn't make any sense. It's the same principle applied to both, to ordinary power and to supply power. So again, how do we come to this knowledge? I began the sermon by discussing the heresies of Vatican II, religious liberty, and that was again condemned as heresy. Do not believe you read the social media, SS SXPX and resistance people, recognize and resist people, no, also the conservatives. They all say, oh, religious liberty, that when it was condemned, it was 
in this context, uh, indifferentism, naturalism, Pope Pius IX condemned religious liberty because it led to indifferentism. But when Paul VI promulgated religious liberty, he, he didn't mean the same thing that was condemned. He meant only that people cannot be coerced to be Catholic, that you cannot force anyone to be Catholic. So that's how it is uh, trying to spin it, to justify Vatican II. And that's actually dishonest, because the context, it, it only was uh, about 100 years between one or the other. The, uh, the context was exactly the same. That is the context, the, the whole point of Paul VI promulgating that heresy was in order to lead people to indifferent, indif indifferentism. Well, that was the whole idea. How do we know this? Because the Catholic Church never, ever coerced anyone to believe the Catholic faith. If you, hear, you read in the history books uh, that some governments did something or the Inquisition in Spain did something that seems to, to be contrary to this, that's not the Catholic Church. The Inquisition of Spain was not the Roman Inquisition. You cannot blame the Catholic Church. And also, even in that case, um, it was a whole different the whole different idea of the Inquisition was for those who were already Catholics uh, in order to see if there was heresy being taught and being propagated as to discover heresy and, 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 to, and to make people uh, pay for their, their crimes because it was a crime against the state. Remember that in a Catholic state, heresy was also a crime against the civil government. So it's a different thing that the Catholic Church never ever coerced anyone to believe, never, it, it doesn't make any sense because the Catholic Church always taught that you have to believe freely. That is that your act of belief and acceptance of the religion has to be a free act, an act of, uh, that is uh, human. If you coerce someone or you have to say that you're Catholic because if not we kill you, that person will say, okay, I'm Catholic, but he doesn't have the faith. He's just saying it because if not, you're going to kill him. Uh, obviously the church never did that. Never ever. The problem here with the Indians uh, during the Spanish uh, conquest, etc., um, there, there were some abuses, but the abuse was not that people coercing the Indians. The abuse was that the Indians were being baptized too, er too soon without the catechism. That was more the problem with regard to, to, this, to the faith. And also you have other things which are more political, etc., of, of abuse of, of the Indians, etc. But again, it was not regarding the faith. It, was, it doesn't make any sense to tell someone, uh, if you do not convert, we kill you. Because again, he will, he will not be sincere in his faith. And therefore, it, 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 it's not actually a profession of faith. It's a profession of fear. So why Paul VI did that if he knew that the church never coerced anyone for the same reason that Freemasons uh, and anti-Catholics were pushing for religious liberty at the time of Pius IX, because they wanted all of the governments to be indifferent towards religion. And ecumenism, ecumenism uh, teaches that the Catholic Church is not one, has lost its unity. That's the key heresy. That's why they say ecumenism, you have to uh, begin dialogue with other religions in order to restore the unity that was lost. So that's a heresy. Collegiality. Collegiality is the, the heresy that says that the supreme power of the church doesn't belong to the pope alone. It belongs to the pope and the bishops together. That's a heresy too. And the subsisted in, finally, is the, uh, uh, a heresy that makes a real distinction between the Catholic Church and the, the Church of Christ. And this was Pius XII explicitly taught that the Catholic Church and Church of Christ, just two names for the same thing. There's no real distinction there. Uh, Protestants are not the Church of Christ. They, they are a false religion. But Vatican II came with this idea of elements. So all, the Catholic Church has all the elements. The Protestants have faith in Christ and the Trinity. So those elements are sufficient to make them part of the Church of Christ. And therefore, you can be saved as a Protestant because you have enough of the elements. The Orthodox, they have valid sacraments. Therefore, that's an element that is salvific. So you can be an Orthodox and, be, uh, and go to heaven. Again, it's a heresy. You cannot be saved unless you are a Roman Catholic and you submit to the Pope. 
and the Orthodox, the Greek and Russian Orthodox, and all of the others do not submit to the authority of the Pope. So, and recently we have Amoris Letizia, uh, this is Bergoglio again, that proves, we are trying to prove that these so-called Vatican II popes have the intention of teaching something that is harmful, harmful to souls. And the heresy is the following, that the commandments are not obligatory, strictly speaking, they're only an ideal that God gave to Moses the Ten Commandments as an ideal. This is how you are a good uh, person. But even if you miss the mark, let's say, you can still go to heaven. No wor don't worry about it. It's only ideals, counsels. They're not strictly speaking commandments. So this document, uh, Amoris Laetitia says, as a priest, you can give communion to a public adul adulterer which means adultery itself is not intrinsically evil. It is not a, 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 a sin, uh, or in certain circumstances, can, it's not a sin, because if you can receive the Holy Eucharist, it means that you are an adulterer and you are in the state of grace at the same time. Therefore, you cannot consider adultery to be a sin if you are giving communion to someone. So all of those things prove that those are objective facts, objective heresies and errors, and those are being taught since the promulgation of Vatican II by those who claim to be popes. And uh, we know that authority is given only for the purpose of leading people to heaven. These doctrines lead people straight to hell. Therefore, they cannot proceed from the same authority. Uh, and the fruits of Vatican II are very clear. You go to the No Sordo Mass, it's centered on, uh, on man. Um, uh, it's a commemoration of the Last Supper, a Protestant service. There is no notion of sacrifice. There is no notion of the real presence. It's all of this meal that is going on and a commemoration of the Last Supper that has produced terrible fruits, people losing the faith. Vatican II was supposed to be something that was going to bring people to the church. Actually, the fruit or the effect is the opposite. People abandon the church, big numbers. They, they have lost all the vocations, and, um, all, and many, many millions of people have abandoned the faith because of Vatican II. So in today, in this uh, Sunday, in which we speak about the propagation of the faith, and we ask for holy priests, and we ask uh, for people to, we ask God that he will bring more people to the faith, um, I hope you have a little more of a, of a clear idea how to show how to tell people when you try to explain what is going on. So pray for more vocations, pray for the increasing of your own Catholic faith in your soul, and for the conversion of the whole world to our Lord and to the Catholic Church. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.